Um, I'm going to go ahead and start on introducing material for exam eight. It will be chapter chapter 16, acids and bases. This is one of the most important skill sets that you will acquire uh, if you have any interest in the health sciences. If you're going into the health science field, you need to understand acids, bases, and pH. <clears throat> so let's get this show on the road. All right, those are the topics we're going to cover. It's not a particularly long chapter, but like I said, these are important topics. Okay. Before we talk about acids and bases in particular, I need to introduce some concepts um, concerning equilibrium. And this is from chapter 17. So when you study for this exam, include this material in chapter 17. Just whatever we cover today, that's all you have to be concerned with. The reason I'm doing this is because an understanding of equilibrium helps you understand how pH works, how acids and bases behave. <clears throat> so rather than cover the whole chapter 17 and, and give you an exam on it, I'll just give you what's required to understand uh, acids and bases. All right. When we talk about equilibrium, what we see, uh, often termed macroscopically, what we see uh, out here is there's no change. You see no change. Whatever the equilibrium is discussing, you don't see a change. But if the equilibrium is, um, in, in this case, our example is a physical equilibrium where you have um, a liquid in a container and we've stoppered it, okay? And you have the liquid here. And the first thing that happens when you put that liquid in there and stopper it is molecules begin to leave the surface. And uh, occupy the vapor phase. And so you're going to have molecules of this uh, liquid becoming gas. And in the beginning, the process is all one way, evaporation only. But eventually, you build up enough pressure here and enough concentration of molecules in the gas phase that they start to return. So now you have two processes going on at the same time. And what you'll notice is in the beginning, the volume, you will see a change. The volume here will decrease as some of this liquid becomes gas. And then eventually what you'll see is it will stop changing. The volume may come down to here, and stop changing. What that means, that macroscopic observation uh, is an indication of the microscopic reality. What is happening in the universe that you can't see? These molecules are uh, evaporating at that's a, a rate of evaporation, and they're also Returning condensation. So what we mean by equilibrium in chemistry is whatever the process we're describing, one process in this direction has a rate and the process in the reverse direction is exactly the same rate. That's why you don't see a change. Now this process we're discussing here is a physical change. 
but you can get an equilibrium set up with chemical changes as well. All right, so that's what this um, scenario is describing. Now, we're, what we're doing is we're uh, drawing a distinction between static equilibrium and dynamic. equilibrium. That's what we're describing here. This is a dynamic process. The evaporation and condensation rate, this is happening at a furious pace. It's, it's, um, it's measurable, but it's, it's a lot faster than you would imagine. Static equilibrium, we don't even deal with because what static equilibrium is saying is that there's no change at the macroscopic level. There's no change at the microscopic level either. That does occur, but um, for our purposes, we're gonna focus on dynamic equilibrium. Okay, so this was a physical equilibrium. And we know that it's physical because the identity of the liquid and the gas are exactly the same. They're the same molecules. Right? There's, there's no difference between the two. There's only a phase change. That's a physical equilibrium. When we talk about chemical equilibrium, then we our best uh, way to describe a chemical equilibrium is with a balanced equation. So if we have, um, let's see. Uh, um, Well, maybe we've got an example. Yeah, we got an example here. It's not a good one, but we'll do it. Um, so let's get that example up here. Water plus carbon monoxide. All right, let's remove this one for now. And we're gonna talk about chemical equilibrium. So our balanced equation is going to be water in the gas phase plus carbon monoxide in the gas phase. And when we are implying an equilibrium, a chemical equilibrium, we use a double barbed arrow, which means it can go this way, it can go that way. And then carbon dioxide. <clears throat> when we first introduced the concept of, of chemical equations and balancing them, we only had a single arrow, single barbed arrow, and we were saying these are reactants and those are products. Okay? In an equilibrium situation, these are reactants and those are products going this way. These are reactants and these are products going that way. Now, what you see on this slide as a, as a box is a problem with the font. That's supposed to be a double barbed arrow. But um, uh, apparently the font that gives you the double barbed arrow is not on this computer, so it won't. It, it, it uh, substitutes uh, a box. Okay. So what we're saying with this chemical equilibrium is that the rate of the forward reaction, right? This forward reaction is equal to the rate of the reverse reaction, right? That's a chemical equilibrium. Now, <clears throat> you don't assume that you're going to have half of it over here and half of it over there. It depends on the character of the reaction. Some reactions go way, way, way far to the right before the rates are balanced and it starts to return. And some of them are mostly over here and only produce a little bit of product before it starts to return at the same rate. And we're going to, to um, uh, give a mathematical expression that will 
uh, address that difference in the reactions. Okay. Um, now, when we talk about chemical equilibrium, we have to talk about it in terms of concentration. We don't talk about it in terms of absolute amounts, typically. We use concentration units like uh, molarity. Molarity for all the components. That's important. Uh, of course, if we have gases, an expression of concentration is also partial pressure. Remember Dalton's law of partial pressure. We could express this equilibrium in terms of the pressure of hydrogen gas and the pressure of carbon monoxide and so forth. Either one works, but they do produce different calculations. All right, so let's be sure this is balanced first. Right. Two hydrogens, two hydrogens, one, two oxygens, two oxygens, one carbon, one carbon. This equation is balanced. Now there's a there's a principle in chemistry that was um, proposed, I believe it was in the late 19th century by a Frenchman called Le Chatelier. And it's very useful, very useful um, technique. What Le Chatelier said is that if the system is at e equilibrium already, and you have a rate this direction and a rate that direction, and they're equal, it's balanced. And you have a given concentration here, 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 and here, and they appear not to change concentrations at all because the rates are equal. Under those circumstances, if you do anything to disturb that equilibrium, the system will respond in such a way as to minimize that disturbance. Okay? So if we say, how could we disturb? You know, how could we use Le Chatelier? Right, to disturb this system. Let's see. Oh, he's got a hat. I forgot that one. How can we disturb this system? Well, one way is to change the concentration of one of the com components, either the reactants or products. Change the concentration. And it, the system will respond to uh, compensate for that change, either up or down, depending on what you do to the system. Okay, so that's where we are with this concept check. With this equation, if we add more water vapor to the reaction vessel, right, we um, add Water vapor, how is the system going to react? What it's going to do is use up some of that, not all of the, the amount that you added, but some of it. It'll react, uh, the excess here will react with what you have here and produce more of that and more of that until the forward rate and the reverse rate are equal again. All right. That's the response. In other words, if you have a balanced equation this way, and you say, I'm going to add this component, it will shift to the right. Okay. If you add more hydrogen, on this side, now you've got more of the com this component and uh, rates of reaction respond to increasing concentrations. So if we increase the concentration of a reactant, or a product in this case, then it will increase the rate in that direction. So what happens is some of this is used up and the rate increases this direction until you have enough here so that the rate here equals the rate there. And as the concentration here decreases, then this rate decreases. And as the concentration over here increases, this rate increases, 
until they're balanced again. So if we add more hydrogen to the flask, the reaction vessel, then the response is going to be shift to the left. Now, this term left and right in reference to an equilibrium shift is only valid if you are referencing a balanced equation, right? If a question occurs that says, um, uh, that here's the system, I'm going to add this component, what will the system respond? How will it respond? If you say left and right, then there's no way for the reader to understand what you mean. You have to incorporate a balanced equation. Then you can say left and right, and it will mean something. All right. So those two examples, we added components. Um, let me add a, a check for you. What if, what if we remove, what if we remove some carbon dioxide? Right? And there are ways to do that remove some carbon dioxide, which way will this reaction shift? It will try to replace some of that carbon dioxide. Why? Because if you reduce this concentration, then this reaction rate is going to be reduced. And this reaction rate will continue at that same rate until we increase this to the point where its reverse reaction is now again balanced. So remove that, shift to the right. Let's say we uh, remove some water. Then the reaction will shift to the left to replace some of that water. Okay. So, <clears throat> excuse me. What I'm going to introduce now is called the law of mass action. Let's see. Discussions? No, no more discussion. All right. So we're going to use a generic. We're going to use a generic uh, um, equation, chemical equation. And we're going to say if we have this reactant and we have a coefficient of A, right, it'd be a one, two, three, four, whatever. And then we have a reactant B with its coefficient and it's in equilibrium with component C and component D. Then we can express concentrations. And when you put a square bracket as a concentration, it's implied that you mean molarity. So some molarity there for that component. Now, this is after the system reaches equilibrium. If you just put A and B in there and let the reaction proceed, of course, initially it's going to go that way because there's none of this over here until it reaches equilibrium. But once you determine the concentration of each of these components at equilibrium, when you don't see any more changes, then you can use this equation, right? And the, it's a constant value, right? It's constant for a constant temperature. The temperature must remain constant for this value to also remain constant. If you change the temperature, you will change the value of K. Right? This is known as an equilibrium constant. And it's calculated the, re the products as written, the products go in the numerator. So the concentration of C and the concentration of D go here. And then we raise each concentration to the power of its coefficient. 
So this would be a little c and this would be a little d. And then in the denominator, you have the reactants. There you go. Um, and that's a, a general expression of the equilibrium constant. Yeah, equilibrium constant. All right. And uh, the equation must be balanced, and the concentrations must represent an equilibrium situation. So here's an example of um, the Haber's equation. We'll leave that one and put Haber over here. So Haber reacted nitrogen gas and hydrogen gas. And it's in equilibrium with ammonia. Let's see. I need some room here. There you go. All right, so this one's going to be two, and this one's going to be three. This is a gas also. Okay. Okay, so how do we write the equilibrium expression for this one? Well, the KEQ, equilibrium constant, is going to have ammonia concentration to the second power, nitrogen concentration to the first power, and hydrogen concentration to the third power. And that's your equilibrium constant at a given temperature. Right? We haven't specified the temperature yet, so we can't put a value in there for K. Um, now, it doesn't matter how much um, reactant you put in here, you could put this reactant, that reactant, and a little product in there at the same time and let the reaction come to equilibrium. Right? If you put a whole lot of this and a whole lot of that and none of that, then it'll come to equilibrium and we take the concentrations and do that and it'll give you the, your K. If we change the concentration, say we put just a little of this, a little of that, and then we put a whole lot of that in there then it's going to come to equilibrium and then you'll get a different set of com, um, com, concentrations. This is known as an equilibrium position. And you put those values in here, you get the same constant. So there's a difference between the equilibrium constant and the equilibrium position. The equilibrium position depends on the initial concentrations. Right? You can choose anything. And once the system comes to equilibrium, you'll have a set of concentrations that are unique for that experiment. And if you put them in the formula, it'll give you the exact same K that you will get with any other experiment you run on that Balanced equation. All right. So, um, let's make some room here. And answer this question. Consider the following equilibrium equation. Now, in this equilibrium equation, we're actually using an acid. Right When we did nomenclature, we talked about how to name an acid. First thing you look for is a hydrogen is the first element. Now, there can be other hydrogens in the molecule, but the first hydrogen, the first or the second or the third, it may have more than one. Those first hydrogens are the ones that are released by the molecule that make it an acid. In this case, we're looking at acetic acid. Okay? And this is in aqueous solution. 
and it's in equilibrium with hydrogen ion uh, aqueous and the acetate ion. Okay. <clears throat> and this is a balanced equation. You can see right off the bat. <clears throat> so what would be the equilibrium constant expression for this one? Well, we put hydrogen ion concentration like that to the first power and the acetate concentration <laughs> to the first power and divided by the acetic acid concentration to the first power. That's your expression right there of the equilibrium constant. Okay? Now, um, we have subscripts for the K, right? I had been using EQ. That's just a general subscript that means this K is a constant for equilibrium. In chemistry, there are lots of Ks, some small letter Ks, some large letter Ks. Uh, so we need to, to tell the reader which K we're talking about. In this case, we're talking about equilibrium, an equilibrium constant. So they have an idea of where it came from. But in this case, we can use a special subscript, Ka. That means this K references an acid dissociation. This acid loses one proton and leaves us with that anion. And that's what the Ka stands for. So they know when you say Ka equals, you're talking about an acid that you put in aqueous solution and it did this thing. <laughs> All right, so now let's let's see if we can do some calculations with uh, the K. All right, for this reaction, calculate the value of the equilibrium constant given the concentrations. So we have N2, N2, O4 gas is in equilibrium with N, O, 2 gas. We have two of those. Okay. <clears throat> We're also given concentrations at equilibrium. Right? So the concentration here is 0 0.055 molar. And the concentration here at equilibrium is 0. 060 molar. There you go. All right. So the first thing you do is write the equilibrium expression. So the equilibrium expression for this equation is going to be NO2 concentration squared and N2O4 in the denominator to the first power, squared first power. Now we can substitute values. 0 0.060 molar squared and 0 0.055 molar. Okay, like I, I've often said, <clears throat> Oops. Calculator somewhere. Put it in the wrong side. Yeah. Side. Okay. All right. So what we just did here solved a problem. This is the thinking part of the problem. The rest is number crunching. So 0 0.060, and we're going to square it. And then we're going to divide by 
0 0.055. And we have two significant figures, right? One, two. These zeros don't count, remember? So I'm going to round it off to 6.5 times 10 to the minus 2. That's the equilibrium constant. One thing you'll notice, if you, if you look up equilibrium constants in any reference manual, they will not have units of measure next to them. The reason for that is the way the equilibrium constant is constructed, you can have any number of components or reactants, uh, products here, any number of reactants here, depending on the balanced equation, and multiple powers, raise them to different powers. So the units of measure for these things would be sky's the limit. It would be, some of them would be a holy mess. So what we do is, once we know and establish that it's an equilibrium constant, we have to say where it came from and be careful about the calculation. And if you do that, then the units of measure will all work themselves out. Usually in a reference manual, uh, if you find a list of equilibrium constants for different reactions, what it will say is, at the top, what are the units of measure for each of the reactants? It will either say things like uh, they're in molarity, or they may be in uh, pressure units. If they're in pressure units, then it may have a subscript of P. Right? Case of P means all these values are actually in pressure units, usually atmospheres. And once you know how, it's, how this, these units are input, then you know that your unit is referenced to either one of these. Okay. So let's see. Um, they got standard notation. So 6.5 and we move negative 2. 1, 2. So 0 0.065 is our answer. Okay. All right. Oh, and there's the calculation. Okay. I'm going to leave this one up here for now. Because I want to talk about this concept called the extent of a reaction. Remember uh, earlier I said that the equilibrium situation is not always half this way and half that way. It can be a lot that way, or it could be a lot this way. And that's what the K will tell you. Notice that the K is denominator over numerator, right? Or a better way to express it is products over reactants. So as written, this would be reactants and products, right? And that's in terms of going this direction. Okay, so what does a value mean? If the value is small, right? This one's uh, very small, less than one. Then what does that mean? That means that the numerator is small and the denominator is large, relatively speaking. What that means is, if this value is small, that means this reaction prefers to stay unreacted, stay in this form rather than that form. Now, if the, if the value for a given reaction happens to be much, much greater than one, that would simply tell you that this reaction prefers product and very little reactant remains, all right? If it's close to one, um, 
and you can't say exactly one because, right, you've got all these powers that are possible. So we can't say exactly one. I mean, uh, some authors do, but they're not right. <clears throat> but if you're close to one, um, not very large, not very small, then we can imply relative balance between the two. That would be half and half, so to speak. Not exactly, but uh, as a general concept. All right. Uh, all right. Uh, let's see. We can we can actually calculate um, unknown equilibrium concentrations uh, if we have a k value for the balanced equation. We set up this one and say we know the k, right? We know the k, and we know the reactant concentration. At equilibrium, we want to find out what this is. It's like any algebraic expression. If you have one unknown in this expression, you can solve for it. Right? It's no different than any other math equation. All right. If the equilibrium lies to the right, that means we have a lot of numerator and little denominator. So the K is going to be greater, much, much greater than one. Right. If it's the other direction, it should be less than one. Right. That simple. Okay. Those are basic concepts for equilibrium. Now we can take those and talk about acids and bases. <clears throat> All right. Um, when we were naming acids, we had a, um, a set of rules that told us how to name an acid, and we recognized an acid by its leading hydrogen. All right, so we're going to take that as our jumping off point. There are several models, several theories about what constitutes an acid and a base. And the first one, historically, that was uh, proposed was by a Swedish scientist, Arrhenius. Okay. Arrhenius' model of an acid and a base simply said that an acid is any compound that when you put it in aqueous solution produces a proton or hydrogen ion and then the anion left over. Okay. That's the Arrhenius definition of an acid. The Arrhenius definition of a base is a molecule that has an, a hydroxyl group in it and we put it in aqueous solution. This process is called um, ionization. Right? This process is called dissociation. Right? There are two, two different chemical processes, uh, but I'm just throwing that in there so that uh, if we talk about it later, you'll, you'll already have a head start. So what happens here is you get the B plus, and the OH minus. And Arrhenius says the acid character, and acids have been described right, by other scientists, including Arrhenius, uh, with certain characteristics. They would do certain things in reaction situations. Uh, some of them you could actually taste, right? like vinegar. If you taste vinegar, which is acetic acid, it will taste sour. All acids taste sour because of that right there, that hydrogen ion. 
the certain taste buds on your tongue respond to an excess of hydrogen ions. If you have a base and you taste that, which, um, which would be most um, drugs, most drugs that you taste are basic in nature. Not all, but, most, but a lot of them are. So if you say you accidentally bite through the capsule and you get some of that drug on your tongue, it will be bitter. It's bitter because your taste buds, the bitter taste buds respond to hydroxides. So this was Arrhenius definition. You had to have a molecule with a hydrogen here to associate. You had to have a molecule here, uh, ionization, excuse me, ionizes. And then you had a molecule here with hydroxyl that dissociates. <coughs> excuse me. The problem came when scientists were investigating uh, basic solutions that did not follow this model. And the perfect example is ammonia. Right? If you put ammonia gas and you add it to water, right, liquid, then what will it do? Well, it will produce hydroxide ions. Right? We know that because it has the characteristics of a base. So it has to produce hydroxides. How did it get there? There are no hydroxides in that molecule. So Arrhenius model doesn't work. Both uh, Bronsted and Lowry simultaneously proposed an alternate definition for acids and bases. And their proposition was that rather than specify a hydroxyl for the base, let's just focus on the hydrogen ion, or I often call it the proton, right? Because what is a hydrogen, right? Hydrogen has one proton here, and then it has one electron here. So if you lose that electron, you have a positive charge. That's a proton. Most of them are protons, right? <laughs> so there are some isotopes, right? Uh, deuterium has a proton and a neutron, uh, but for most cases, proton works. <clears throat> so how does it get that hydroxyl? Well, we use Bronsted and Lauer's definition of an acid uh, or a base. A Bronsted Lowry let's see we'll spell his name right Bronsted Lowry acid equals a hydrogen ion donor in other words it loses a proton so this acid loses a proton here that means it's an acid and then a Bronsted-Lowry base equals a proton acceptor. Okay? So here's what happens. This is the base. Water is the acid. It transfers one of these protons over here. Right? It's the proton donor, the acid. This is the proton acceptor. It's the base. And what do you have? Well, when water loses one positive uh, hydrogen ion, right, it leaves a negative behind. And now it only has one oxygen and one hydrogen. So that's why this OH has a minus charge. But what happens when the proton attaches itself to ammonia, then we get ammonium, right? You remember that polyatomic ion? That's where ammonium comes from. Okay? That's Bronsted-Lowry's definition. And 
it covers all the assets and bases that Arrhenius would define, plus more that Arrhenius uh, model does not define. So it encompasses more, including Arrhenius. Okay, there's an example. In this case, HCl transfers a proton to water, so it's the acid. Water now becomes the base. It accepts the proton. And what we get is Cl minus and H3O plus. H3O plus is a polyatomic ion called hydronium. Okay. There we go. Now, <laughs> we've got a generic acid here with water as the base, and it produces a hydronium and um, the A minus from the acid. If we use that same approach for this one, this is the base and that's the acid, right? So what we find is that this is a nomenclature, uh, definition time. This acid, when it loses a proton, produces a conjugate base. Conjugate base. And this base, when it accepts a proton, produces a conjugate base. See, and make room. A conjugate acid. Now let's look at that. If this acid produces a conjugate base, what do bases do? Bases accept protons. Can this accept a proton? Yeah. It could accept a proton from this molecule and go back the other direction. That's where the equilibrium comes in. Or this base accepts a proton and produces this molecule. Can it become an acid? Sure. It can transfer that proton to this base and go back this direction. All right. Okay. Now, when these processes happen, uh, when you... When you do this, put that acid in water, and it transfers a proton over here and produces this and this. <clears throat> this is the way acids operate in solution, always. They always transfer one proton at a time. Now, if you just put an acid in aqueous solution, this is what it does. It transfers a proton to water. Now, uh, we wrote this expression here, but that's for convenience. The reality is protons, hydrogen ions, never, ever exists as separate protons floating around. They're always transferred and attached to something. So this is the reality. This is real. Right? This is convenient. Now, as far as calculation go, you get the same results either way. So we will be using this form later. And um, just recognize that this is a reality. Right? There are no free protons here. We get this acid transferring to this base, and we get this conjugate base that can accept a proton from this conjugate acid. Now, one characteristic of what we would call an acid-base pair an acid-base pair would be this acid and that base. Notice 
that this part of the molecule has to be exactly the same as this part of the molecule, only now it has a minus one charge. And only one proton can leave this molecule at a time. So this one goes over there like that. Uh, what would happen if you had an acid with two protons in it? If we had like this, a two. In that case, you would only lose one proton at a time. Now, this conjugate base could also be an acid, right? It could transfer that proton to another water molecule. So that's a different, that's a second reaction. That's characteristic of acid chemistry. It only loses or ionizes one proton at a time, one hydrogen ion at a time. And that's the way we write our equilibrium expressions for each one of those steps. If you have two protons, we'll have uh, a K for the first one and a K for the second. If you have three protons, we'll have a K1, a K2, and a K3. All right. So this is the, um, the publisher's idea of um, illustrating that point. Right, we ionize that proton. It leaves electron behind and goes over here and attaches itself to this one covalently and produces this molecule. All right. So notice also that water can act as an acid or a base. If it acts as an acid, then it will uh, donate a proton to the base. If it acts as a base, it will accept a proton from an acid. Okay, now we're going to try something here. Try to figure out if we understand what a conjugate acid-base pair is. So let's make some room. Uh, let me see how far along we are. Okay. Okay, which of the following represent conjugate acid-base pair? How about A? What? ACL and HNO3. We don't even have to consider the rules. These are both acids. They can't be an acid-base pair. These are undissociated acids. So we throw that one out. How about this one? H3O plus and OH minus. If we write this one like H O H H like that, then you can see that if we lose only one proton, we have a water molecule. That's not it. This is the result of losing two protons, okay? So that can't be it. How about C? H2SO4 and SO4 two minus. This part of the molecule is the same, but if that's the case, then we had to lose two hydrogen ions in order to do that. That can't be. That's not a valid conjugate acid-base pair. What would be? Well, if we kept one of the hydrogens and only one negative charge, that would be a valid acid-base pair. But as written, it's not. Uh, so by process of elimination, the last one probably is. Right? What is HCN in aqueous solution? 
hydrocyanic acid. And this is the cyanide ion. This is the same on both sides. And we're missing one proton. This is an acid base pair. All right. <clears throat> and there it is in green. <laughs> Okay, come on, there we go. Okay, so when we're talking about strong acid, the uh, popular definition of a strong acid would be anything that would burn your skin right, or cause you some type of injury. But in chemistry, that's not the case. A strong acid in chemistry is an acid that completely ionizes, uh, yeah, completely ionizes in aqueous solution. In other words, uh, an acid like this, HCl in aqueous solution, will produce this and this, and there's no return. It goes all the way. Okay? That's a strong acid. Or if we had uh, this one. Nitric acid. Ah. There we go. It would produce that proton and this polyatomic ion. Nitrate. That's a strong acid. That's the definition of a strong acid. Complete dissociation. Now, you can have very, very low concentrations of these in solution, and they would not injure your skin if you spilt it on. Right. One process is intensive, and the other process on your skin is extensive. Right? It depends on concentration. Um, let's see. Yeah, goes all the way to the right. Now, I did the simplified version here. Rather than react it with water and produce the hydronium, like you see there in the slide, uh, I simplified it and just said it ionized and went that direction. But the one that's given there is, is reality. Now, for a weak acid, there is an equilibrium set up. And we showed you one earlier. Right? C2H3O2. Acetic acid actually does set up an equilibrium. Okay, and in this case, you do have only a small amount on this side, and most of it is over here. That's a weak acid, and it, it sets up an equilibrium situation also. Right? Most of the molecule remains intact. Now that arrow is, is kind of misleading because you do get some of it going this direction, but most of it stays as the unionized molecule. Okay, so our strong acid definition produces lots of uh, product, and our weak acid definition produces very little product. And then you have a gray area in between. There are some acids that are vanishingly weak. <laughs> Okay, now the concept is, um, if this is the acid, this would be the conjugate base.
Okay? This would be an acid, and this would be the conjugate base. Okay? Now, we can say something about the strength of the base relative to its parent, the acid from which it is derived. If the acid is strong, that means that this part of the molecule has a very weak connection with the hydrogen. So it gives it up really easily. That's a strong acid. So when it produces the conjugate base, think about does that, um, does that conjugate base want a hydrogen? Does it want to attract a hydrogen? No. So strong acids produce weak conjugate bases. In this case, we have a weak acid. It has a very strong attachment to that hydrogen. But it does give it up to a limited extent. So when it does give up some, and it produces this one, since this is a weak acid, now this one really has a strong attraction to hydrogen ions or hydrogens from any other source. And it prefers this side. So a weak acid produces a strong conjugate base. Okay. So um, strong acids, the forward reaction is preferred, predominates uh, almost exclusively to the right-hand side, and the weak acid prefers the uh, reactant side. All right, that's what the illustration is trying to show you. For the strong acid, the conjugate base is weak. For the weak acid, the conjugate base is strong. These are some common strong acids. I showed you a couple of them already. Uh, hydrochloric acid, nitric acid, sulfuric acid is, uh, well, perchloric acid, Right? Each one of those, hydrochloric, nitric, perchloric acid, each have only one proton that they can give up. But they do it very efficiently. Those are strong acids. In fact, perchloric acid is the, probably the strongest acid I've ever worked with. Uh, sulfuric acid is also strong. The one thing about sulfuric acid is, though, let's see, uh, let's remove this one. And we'll put sulfuric acid down here. So when we say strong acid for sulfur, remember, one proton at a time plus this conjugate base. All right. What about the second proton? Right, if we take this one, and it can give up its proton aqueous, and produce this conjugate base. This is a strong acid, all the way to this side. This is a weak acid. It prefers this one. Now, it will give up that proton if it encounters um, a strong base that attracts the proton away from it. But just to illustrate the point, this K is very, 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 very large, right? And this K is less than one. Okay. Right, remember uh, nomenclature. Just a reminder, why don't we call HNO3 hydronitric acid, like hydrochloric acid? The rules say, if there's an oxygen there, you don't say hydro, right? That's just a reminder, right? So we say, we take the, uh, we take this polyatomic ion, which is nitrate. When you add a hydrogen to it, nitrate eights become X. So it's nitric acid, that's it. Um, uh, ClO4 minus, is perchlorate. 
So if we add a hydrogen to it, it's perchloric acid. All right. Uh, all right, those are examples. Examples, examples, all right. Those acids where the, the conjugate base part of the molecule, the A part of the molecule, has an oxygen in it are called oxyacids. All right, so sulfuric acid, nitric acid, uh, phosphoric acid, right? They all have oxygen in them. A uh, boric acid, right? H3BO3, boric acid. I remember um, back when I was a kid, if uh, if I got um, irritated eye or uh, any type of infection in the eye, my mother would mix up a solution of boric acid, right? It's a weak acid, but it has a soothing effect on the eye. So she would use that, that drop in my eye. And it, it didn't hurt me, so I, I guess it's okay. Organic acids. Organic acids have carbon in them, right? And um, organic acids typically, but not always, have this group attached to them. This is called the carboxyl group. So if you see that group, and um, acetic acid, I erased it. So acetic acid, we write it like this, C2H3O2. But we can also write it like this, CH3, C, uh, three, uh, oh, CH, excuse me. See, I've got two carbons, I've got three, yeah. And then we do like this, excuse me, O, oh. Pardon me. I had to shut my phone up. <clears throat> so that's not a good way to draw it. Let's see. Let me draw it better than that. Um, when we draw organic compounds, if we put CH3, those three hydrogens are attached to this carbon, not to the next atom. So they're all attached to that one. And then we attach to another carbon. And there's your carboxyl group. Here, that's the acid hydrogen in this molecule. These hydrogens are not acidic. They don't dissociate. Another way to write it would be like this. With our hydrogens over here like that, like that, carbon here, oxygen there, oxygen there, and then like that. That would be a, a better representation of the structure. But most organic acids have this part of the molecule attached to them. There are exceptions. I mean, there are other ways to get an acid with a carbon structure. The carbon structure tells you, along with the hydrogens, that this is an organic molecule. There's acetic acid, right? Lactic acid, right? Lactic acid is the is the thing that causes your muscles to burn uh, after uh, exercising. And this COOH is representation of the carboxyl group. So formic acid is the simplest carboxyl carboxylic acid. Right? It only has that plus a hydrogen. And it's called formic acid because in Latin, uh, formic is derived from the Latin word for ant. And that's one of the chemicals that ants have in their bite. Fire ants are really bad. Um, they have formic acid. They have a bunch of other stuff too. Um, but 
formic acid for sure is in their bite and that and that's a, a nasty nasty sting that they give you citric acid that we find in um, all types of citrus fruits is that molecule it actually has three carboxylic acid groups on it uric acid right this is uh, a compound that you don't want accumulating in your body because it accumulates in your joints and it causes gout or it causes it can cause also kidney stones but um, some reptiles and all birds eliminate nitrogen waste from their body as uric acid, right? It's a solid, right? So when they eliminate it, they don't lose water. All right. So consider one molar hydrogen chloride in aqueous solution. We know it's a strong acid. And if we write its uh, balanced equation, we have that and uh, this. Right. So if this is one molar, when you put it in there, you have one molar. What is that concentration? All of this becomes all of that. Right? So this goes to that. All right. Um, now let's answer this question. Order these from the strongest to weakest base. All right, so we've got the uh, HCl produces this one, right? How about water? Well, when water dissociates, it produces this plus this, right? Right, H-O-H, that's water, but it's very weak. Um, and if we have this other possibility, we have um, a weak acid HA that produces this one plus this one in an aqueous solution. Then what can we say about that? If this is weak, this is strong. This is weak. This is strong. This is strong. This is weak. So if we order them strongest to weakest, the weakest is going to be Cl minus, right? That's the weakest. What we have to do is decide uh, water, well, water is a, a weak base, right? If we're looking at this side of the equation, not that side, then water is weak. And I should be the weakest. And then this one is in the middle. Okay? I think that's the way it goes. All right? That's a very, very weak base, chloride. A minus is a good base, base, but not as uh, water's caught in the middle, huh? Okay, so I, I misinterpreted that. What they're saying is that water is a stronger base than this. Okay, if it's a strong base, it has to accept a proton. So it accepts a proton from a, another water molecule. And that's a weak base. Right? So it's going to produce hydronium ions 
plus hydroxyl. All right. Since we weren't actually given a, a value for the weak acid, it, and we don't know yet what the value is for the equilibrium of water, then we can't make a, a, a qual quantitative comparison. Right? We have to accept the, the uh, uh, description as given in the slide. Okay. Acetic acid and hydrocyanic acid are both weak acids. Acetic acid is stronger than hydrocyanic. Right? So let's see what, what does that look like in a balanced equation. Okay, yes. And then hydrocyanic would then this uh, would uh, ionize to this and this. Okay, what are the conditions? Acetic acid is stronger than HCN. Right. Stronger this direction and weaker this direction. So if this is weaker, then this would be stronger and this would be weaker as a conjugate base. Right. We know that. So can we arrange these in weakest to strongest? Well, let's see. Uh, chloride is going to be the weakest because it comes from hydrochloric acid, which is a strong acid. So we know from weakest to strongest, the chloride is going to be the weakest. Okay. Then we can say something about uh, cyanide is going to be stronger than acetate. So we can put cyanide here, but we can put acetate here. The water probably goes here. I'm just speculating. They're either going to put water here or there. Uh, it didn't give us the answers, did it? Or is it still? Oh, it's still presenting the evidence. Okay. Oh, we're going to get, all right, we're going to get some uh, quant quantitative approach. All right. So when we write, when we write this one, water plus water is an equilibrium with hydronium and hydroxyl. How would we write the equilibrium expression for this molecule. One thing, one detail I left out of the equilibrium expressions is if any of the reactants or products are solids or pure liquids, we leave them out of the calculation. So in this case, that's a liquid, that's a liquid, and these are aqueous. They're good, aqueous. So these are the only parts that enter the K calculation. And we give it a special subscript KW because it belongs only to water. So this would be in the numerator and the denominator would be missing because water is pure liquid. So we have H3O plus times OH minus, and that's equal to one, times 10 to the minus 14. Okay. Or we could write it um, like this. Simplify. Okay. That's KW. All right.
Uh, let's see. So, I did speculate and get them in the proper order. <clears throat> but that quantitative description really didn't help us much because we don't have the K values for either acetic acid or hydrocyanic acid. We need those to make a definitive judgment. But we made a good guess. Okay. Notice that in this reaction, let's see, let me let me remove some of the clutter. So here, like that. Notice that in this reaction, water can be both acid and base. This is pure water. That's it. Nothing else is in there. So we can assign this one as an acid and this one as a base. So this acid transfers a proton here and produces a conjugate base. And this one accepts a proton and produces a conjugate acid. That's known as amphoteric behavior. From the Greek, ampho meaning both. It means it can go bo both ways. And anytime you dissolve something, dissolve an acid or a base in water, they have their reaction. The acid um, ionizes in water. It reacts with water. But this one is also going on at the same time. It never goes away. It's always there in addition to whatever else you do, right? So there, and this um, expression is, actually it says 25 degrees C. I think it's closer to 24 degrees, but you know, it's just a, a minor detail. So whatever happens in the solution, the product of hydrogen ion concentration and hydroxyl ion concentration is always 10 to the minus 14. Okay, here are three possible situations. You've got a solution where you've got exactly the same concentration of hydrogen ions and hydroxyl ions. That would be an example here would be pure water. So when you get one molecule of that, one molecule of that to react, you get one of these and one of these, correct? So if this is 10 to the minus 14, what do these have to be in pure water? They have to be 10 to the minus seven and 10 to the minus seven molar. That's the only thing they can be in pure water at 25 degrees. So 10 to the minus seven times 10 to the minus seven is 10 to the minus 14, correct? You add the exponents. This is a neutral solution. Okay. Now what happens if the hydrogen ions are greater than the hydroxyls? Say we add a little hydrochloric acid to it. Now we've increased this amount. In order to keep this one a constant, say we put enough hydrogen ions in there to make this one 10 to the minus 6. Right? 10 to the minus 6 is larger than 10 to the minus 7. What would this one have to be? 10 to the minus 8. Right? 6 plus 8 is 14. This is acidic. And it can go acidic on down. Right? You could have 10 to the minus 1 here and 10 to the minus 13 here. We go the other direction where the hydroxyls are greater. Let's try this one. Let's say we go here. This is 10 to the minus 4. That means this one would be 10 to the minus 10. That case would be basic where the hydroxyls dominate. 
right? Where the hydrogen ions dominate, it's acidic. All right. So for which one of these is correct? Well, if the hydrogen ion concentration is less than 10.7, that would be in this region. It would be basic. So that's that's not acidic. <clears throat> <clears throat> oh, in an acidic aqueous solution, correct. Right. A can't be. Right. It's, it's the wrong direction. B, yes. B is true. How about C? If hydroxyls are greater than 10 to the minus 7, we're basic. And if hydroxyls are greater than hydrogen ions in D, that's also basic. So the only one that is true of acidic aqueous solutions is B. All right. Uh, let's try this problem. In an aqueous solution in which hydroxide ions are 2 times 10 to the minus 10, the hydrogen ions would be what? And the solution is what? Okay, so if we know that the hydroxide ions, right, the hydroxide ions are 2 times 10 to the minus 10, correct? Molar. Then we have an equation here where the hydrogen ions are there, and this is equal to... 10 to the minus 14. Okay? We have an equation in one unknown. We can solve for that one. Right. So we put that one, leave that one here, and put this one in the denominator. 10 to the minus 14 divided by, well, let's see, this is 1, 2, 0. 2 times 10 to the minus 10. What's that equal to? Well, if you don't have your calculator, you can split these up, right? One over two is one half, right? 0 0.5 times what? Well, this is a negative in the denominator. It's positive in the numerator. So this is 10 to the minus 4, which is equal to 5 uh, times 10 to the minus 5. All right, so that's hydrogen ions. Okay, so this solution is acidic. That value is greater than 10 to the minus 7. Right. 5 times 10 to the minus 5 is acidic. Let's see. Uh, there. <clears throat> is acidic. There's the calculation. There you go. <clears throat> now, if it's greater than 10 to the minus 7 at 25 degrees, then uh, it's acidic. But if you have a different temperature, then the equilibrium constant is going to change its value. But the definition of acidic and basic still holds. If the hydrogen ion concentration is greater than the hydroxyl concentration, it's acidic, no matter what temperature it is. And if the hydroxyl is greater than the hydrogen ion concentration, it's basic. But we're not going to go there. Next thing we're going to do is pH. What is pH? There was a Swedish uh, scientist named Sorensen. And he was working with biological systems. And he was getting tired of expressing hydrogen ion concentrations as these very small numbers with uh, negative powers of 10. And it was just, you know, it makes your head spin. So he proposed this transformation of the hydrogen ion concentration. He said, what if we take it and do a common log transformation. 
In other words, what's the power of 10 that equals that number? That would really simplify it. But he also noticed that, <clears throat> say, if this were neutral, <clears throat> and we take the log of that, 10 to what power equals 10 to the minus 7? Well, minus 7. Right? Right? And uh, he didn't want uh, negative numbers either. Right? Positive numbers are better. Because then you don't have to write the positive in there. So he just put a negative out here, and that changed this one to positive. And he gave this one a name, pH. So that's the pH transformation of hydrogen ion concentration. Negative log of hydrogen ion concentration equals pH. Okay? That's a formula. And you can use it on any concentration of hydrogen ions. Now, sometimes the concentration of hydrogen ions is so high that you'll get a negative pH. That's just the nature of the calculation. Most of the time, we use only positive pHs. Uh, different. The concentrations keep the pH in the positive range. So, let's look at this on a continuum. Right? Here's neutral. Right? What did we say at neutral? At 25 degrees, the hydrogen ion concentration equals 10 to the minus 7 molar. Okay? So what would the pH be? Well, the pH, pH would be 7. Right? 7 pH. And fair warning, when you write pH, the P must be small. The H must be large. If you write something like this, or like this, it is wrong. Okay, so what if we go this direction and we say, okay, now we're gonna have a concentration of hydrogen ions equal to 10 to the minus six mole, right? That's more acidic. So we're going, Toward the acid range here, more and more acidic as we get 10 to the minus 5, 10 to the minus 4, on down here, say, to 10 to the minus 1, right? So each time, the pH becomes 6, 5, 4, and then 1. So what that says is, the more acidic the solution, the smaller the pH number. Now, when you're doing the calculation, this is just a note. The number of decimal places in the log is equal to the number of significant figures in the, in the hydrogen ion concentration. So if we had, uh, let's see. Uh, before we had, say, 2.0 times 10 to the minus, uh, I forget what it was, 4, 10, excuse me, 10 to the minus 10. Minus 10, okay? If we, if we determine the pH of this value, we have two significant figures. Right, right there. So if we take the negative log, what would that pH be? Well, I just have to push in two, exponent, negative 10, take the log of it and change the sign. So I have 9.69897, right? How many of those decimals can I keep? The number of decimals from here over equals the number of significant figures. So I would round this up, and that would make it 9.70 pH. Okay? And when you go backwards, right, and we'll do that in a minute, when you go backwards, say pH 
to hydrogen ion concentration, then the number of decimal places tell you how many significant figures are in the hydrogen ion concentration value. Okay? So the higher the pH, the more basic. We go the other direction, hydrogen ions say out here to, uh, um, I don't know, 10 to the minus 10. That would be pH 10. So this is the basic end. The higher the pH, the more basic. And that's simply an artifact of the transformation, negative log. Is, is why that happens. Okay. Here's some examples of, uh, of uh, foods and household products and even body fluids um, and what their pHs are. Right. One molar hydrochloric acid is zero, zero pH. Uh, Stomach acid is around two, unless you eat a, uh, a, a meal that's heavy in tomatoes, right? <laughs> and then the pH might drop to one. Lemon juice is about two and a half. Vinegar is uh, 3.2 or 3.3. And then uh, milk, water, blood. Blood is slightly basic, right? The, the buffered range, I use a term that we haven't defined yet, but the range for blood is actually 7.35 to 7.45 pH. Very, very narrow range. Right? Your blood has to be in that range in order for you to stay healthy. Right? If you're a diabetic and your body... Uh, can't use glucose, it tries to use other things. And it produces acids. And they overwhelm the system and they cause your blood to go acidic. That's a condition known as ketoacidosis. And it will drop below 7.35 and you will be in trouble. You better get to the hospital in a hurry. Okay, uh, ammonia, right? We used that as an example early on is a basic solution. It's a, a pH of almost 12. All right. Calculate the pH of each one of these. All right. So I'm going to erase these, make some room. And let's see, what do we have for the first one? If the hydrogen ion concentration is 10 to the minus 4, what is its pH? Well, negative log of 1 times 10 to the minus 4. Right? Remember log rules. The log of A times B is equal to the log of A plus the log of B. So what's the log of 1? 10 to what power equals 1? Well, 10 to that power is 0. The log of 10 to minus 4 is minus 4. So we add those together and we get minus 4. Then we change the sign, and that's the pH. PH is four. Okay. How about the next one? How do we do the pH of that? Hydroxyl ion concentration, 0 0.040 molar hydroxyl ion concentration. Well, one way is to use the uh, equilibrium expression. One times 10 to the minus 14 equals hydrogen ion concentration times hydroxyl ion concentration, 0 0.040.
So hydrogen ion concentration is equal to one times 10 to the minus 14 divided by 0 0.040. Or let's write this in uh, scientific notation. That would be 4.0 times 10 to the minus two. One, two. So that would be one fourth times 10 to the minus 12. Well, this would be 0 0.25 times 10 to the minus 12, well, which would be 2.5 times 10 to the uh, minus 13. Then we can take the negative log of it because that's the hydrogen ion concentration. And I get 12.6. Let's see. Uh, two significant figures. 12.60 pH. Okay. So let's see if the slide agrees with me. Okay. Yep. There you go. So let's go the other direction. Suppose you have a pH of a solution is 5.85. pH equals 5.85. Okay. What's the hydrogen ion concentration of this solution? Well, this is equal to the negative log of the hydrogen ion concentration. Remember, this is base 10. So what do logs say? Well, you got to get rid of that negative first. Right? You can't resolve a negative log. So we got to move the negative on both sides, this side, minus 5.85 equals the log of hydrogen ions to the 10. Now, we know that um, the nature of the log is that the base, this is the power of the base that equals that value. So 10 to the minus 5.85 equals hydrogen ion concentration. Okay. Now we just crunch the numbers. So you got to find out where is that on your calculator. Usually, it's a, uh, a function shift of the log key, the L-O-G key. You'll see it's 10 to the X. Right? So if I put in 5.85, change the sign, and then punch 10 to the X, okay, we've got two decimals. We need two significant figures. So hydrogen ion concentration is 1.4 times 10 to the minus 6 molar. Uh, that's wrong. No, that's right. Yeah, uh, three significant figures. My mistake is 1.41. There you go. No, 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 no. I was right. I was going the wrong direction, right? The number of decimal points in the pH is the number of significant figures in the hydrogen ion concentration. So that's wrong. It needs to be 1.4 times 10 to the minus 6. All right. Now, remember this Sorensen's logarithmic transformation of hydrogen ion concentration can just as easily be used for others. 
So if we use it for OH, we would have POH. And that would simply be the negative log of the OH concentration. Okay? So if we have KW equals hydrogen ion concentration times hydroxyl ion concentration, and we can do um, the negative log of that entire expression. Okay? Just take the negative log of the whole thing. Negative log. What does that give you? Negative log of KW equals negative log of hydrogen ion concentration plus the negative log of the hydroxyl ion concentration. Okay? All right. So we know this would be what? PKW. This would be PH, and this would be POH. See? So what would the PKW be? What the negative log of 1 times 10 to the minus 14 is equal to 14. That's PKW. So this is equal to 14, right? That's pH, that's POH. <clears throat> so this is a more convenient way to deal with it, <clears throat> deal with transformations to find out what the pH and, or the POH or the hydrogen ion concentration or the hydroxyl ion concentration. This would be a lot quicker if you know one and you want to find the other, just subtract it from 14 and you get the other. So here's an example. What's the POH for each of the following? Well, let's see. The first one, A, we determined that that one was a pH of 4, correct? That's a pH of 4. So the POH equals 14 minus 4 equals 10. Okay. Uh, let's see, two decimal places. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Zero, zero. This is zero, zero. So that's going to be four from 14. 14 is uh, an exact number. So it'd be 10.00 zero. is the POH. How about the next one? What's the POH of that one? Well, we just take the negative log of it. Negative log of uh, 4.0 times 10 to the minus 2. All right? So, and I get, let's see. Two significant figures, I need two decimal places, equals 13.98 POH. Oops, what did I do wrong? Oh, hold on a second. Okay, I made a mistake. Yeah, I did make a mistake. Decimal points. <laughs> One point, two significant figures, uh, four zero, POH. My apologies. I misread my calculator.
If the pH is 5.85, what is the hydroxyl ion concentration? Right? So, let's make it easy on ourselves. If we need the hydroxyl ion concentration, let's do this. pOH equals 14 minus 5.85. And so 14 into 5, 5 minus is 8.15. Now the OH concentration is equal to um, 10 to the minus 8.15. And let's see, we've got uh, two decimal places, so I need two significant figures. 7.1 times 10 to the minus 9 molar. Yeah, that's wrong. It needs two significant figures because you have two decimal places. All right, so it should be 7.1 times 10 to the minus 9. <clears throat> All right. Now, if you have a strong acid solution and you're told the concentration of that acid is a given value of molarity, that is the hydrogen ion concentration because it completely dissociates. So, two molar hydrochloric acid is two molar hydrogen ions. Right. So all we have to do now is just calculate the, the log transformation and we get a value of minus 0 0.3. So in this case, the calculation gave us a minus pH, which really doesn't mean much. Um, when Sorensen invented this uh, transformation, um, he would never have used such a um, a low pH solution in his work. He, in fact, he studied proteins, right? biological systems with proteins, and uh, uh, a pH of minus point three would cause the proteins to coagulate. It would denature them. So he would never use anything uh, that acidic. Um, now, we can measure pHs directly using a special device called a pH meter. And the pH meter has an electrode in it that is sensitive to uh, hydrogen ions in solution. They can cross the membrane into the internal parts of the electrode. And there's an electrical signal that is altered by the increase of hydrogen ions, and the device interprets that as a pH. Uh, but if you get below two and a half or above 10 and a half, then you need a special electrode because most electrodes, certainly the student electrodes that we use in the lab, uh, will not tolerate a pH less than two and a half or greater than 10, 10 and a half. All right. All right, it's 11 o'clock. Let me see how much further I have to go. I do want to talk about buffered solutions here in a minute. So if we have an aqueous solution that is 2 times 10 to the minus third molar in hydrochloric acid, what's its pH? Okay, I'm going to have to move along here. We know that it's a strong acid, so the hydrogen ion concentration is exactly the same number. And then we can calculate the pH from that number, 2.7. What if the pH is 1.5 times 10 to the minus 11? What, uh, excuse me, what is the pH of a solution that is 1.5 times 10 to the minus 11 molar 
in hydrochloric acid? Well, we first have to consider, um, remember, water is dissociating at the same time as the hydrogen ions from hydrochloric acid. So look at the difference in the concentrations. Hydrochloric acid is 1.5 times 10 to the minus 11 molar. But in pure water, hyd the hydrogen ions or the hydroniums are 10 to the minus 7. It's, they're four orders of magnitude higher. So this, this pH um, has no effect on the neutrality of the water. contributing only a, a minor amount to the pH. The pH, in effect, is still 7 because the, the concentration of hydrochloric acid is so low. How about, let's see. Uh, here we go. The pH of nitric acid, if it's that concentration, right, completely dissociates. It's much stronger than 10 to the minus 7. So the dominant transformation is nitric acid. And we'll use that to calculate our pH. 1.82. Okay, what's a buffer solution? A buffer is a solution that will maintain its pH um, with very, very, very small movements, either acidic or basic. If you add a strong acid to a buffered solution, it will not move, but just a little bit to the acid side or a strong base, a little bit to the basic side, but not much. It tends to hold its pH. It's not constant. It doesn't fix the pH value, but it does maintain the pH within a very narrow range. That's a buffered solution. It resists the change of pH. And it's typically constructed from a mixture of the weak acid. Uh, I'm going to use an example. Right? A mixture of the weak acid with its conjugate base. So if we have just the right amount of this and this in solution, we can create a buffer. It needs to be a weak acid to produce a strong base. Conjugate base. Okay. So <clears throat> if we add hydrogen ions to this solution, say we have enough of that, then we have enough of that, now it's in equilibrium. If we think, think Le Chatelier, if we add hydrogen ions, and hydrogen ions, what will happen? This is a strong base. It's going to react with those excess hydrogens and produce the uh, unionized acid. It's going to consume. It's going to consume those hydrogens, right? And the hydrogens are responsible for pH. So if if it consumes those hydrogens, now the pH didn't move much. Maybe it moved just a hair. Because we're, we're reestablishing the equilibrium, that means when we add some of this, we'll use some of it, but not all of it. Just enough to reestablish equilibrium. And that means that now we have less hydrogen than we first put in. I mean, that we uh, put in as a stress to the system. What if we put hydroxide ions in there? See, the hydrogen ions react with conjugate base. The hydroxides 
react with a weak acid. So if we put hydroxides in here, you can look at it two different ways. If we have the hydroxide, which is a very strong base, it can take hydrogens from this one and produce uh, produce water plus that. So if, if we add hydro hydroxyl ions here, we're going to shift the reaction to the right slightly. And that consumes hydroxide ions. So it only shifts slightly basic. Not a lot, just enough. The other way you can look at it is all of this is in the same solution. So if we add hydroxides here, they can attach to those hydrogens, make water. Okay? When, we, when we remove hydrogen ions, we shift the reaction this way. So either way, you get an increase in this and a decrease in the hydroxyls. All right. So if a solution is buffered with ammonia, to which has been added ammonium chloride, what reaction will occur if a strong base such as sodium hydroxide is added? All right. So let's let's put that on the board. If we have uh, ammonia in aqueous solution, and we have ammonium here, and the chloride, right? Ammonium chloride is completely soluble, so chloride is a spectator. It doesn't do anything because it's a very, very weak base. Right? It won't react with anything. So we have this. Now we have a reaction set up where you have water there, hydroxide there. And what would happen if we added strong base? If we added strong base here, it's going to react with the ammonium and shift the, the equilibrium in this direction and use up some of that hydroxide. Right? So sodium hydroxide with the hydroxide ion would react with this one, the ammonium ion. So that would be B. Okay. That's how a buffer works. Okay, that's as far as we can go in this course with buffers. And with acids and bases and pHs. So you have a basic understanding of an acid, a base, and what a what a pH, uh, what pH means. So in the medical profession, in fact, you, I even showed you what the normal uh, blood plasma pH range is. Uh, that gives you a, a step up. If you haven't already covered that in uh, anatomy and physiology, but if you're, if you're going on into things like uh, nursing or even medical lab tech or, or uh, uh, any medical professions, you're gonna need to know something about pH. And that's what I've tried to do today.